Good morning. Welcome back, folks. This is Billy, and uh, you're here for another episode of Log Talk with Pertinier Outdoors. This week, we have a special guest, uh, Mark Sheeran from the Adirondacks. He is, uh, he is a Big Woods Buck tracker, and uh, he is actually a team member of the Big Woods Bucks team out of Maine. So that's how I cross paths with, uh, with Mark, and being that we're approaching whitetail season here, Wanted to switch up the pace a little bit and have a discussion about hunting the big woods here in New York and tracking as that's a huge tradition up in the Adirondacks especially, but uh, it's something that I'd like to put to work here locally uh, this winter or this season once we get some snow on the ground. So fun discussion coming up with Mark and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. He's a, a very energetic and uh, passionate guy and I didn't have to talk a whole lot during this podcast. He had a, a lot to say and um, was really fun to listen back to and follow along with. So we've got that coming up for you here. Um, As far as some updates, I have a correction from last week's episode. Uh, My dad called me after just to give me some legal advice. I want to be clear on something with the beer. Uh, So we are doing our beer rollout on the 30th. So if you're listening to this, it's at least Monday, uh, whatever the date would be there, the 28th, Monday the 28th. Um, we're doing it, the rollout on the 30th at Windy Brew. Um, to be clear, Windy Brew is selling the beer, not Pertinier Outdoors. Uh, I had mentioned on the podcast that if you're not going to be able to make it and you would like to be, be able to get the beer, um, that you could reach out to us. What I meant there and what's important for you to know is that, uh, I, I, we cannot physically sell you the beer, but you can purchase the beer from Windy Brew and uh, we could, you know, if you're somebody that I know or we run past with, or even if you'd like to have Windy Brew, um, we can figure out a way to get stuff to you. Uh, it is a limited batch. Uh, we are um, getting good feedback on how many people are going to be there. So I suspect that between the the buying the cans as well as buying growlers to go and people buying pints there, um, especially throughout the, the end of next week into the weekend, uh, that it may not last too long. So if you're interested, I uh, definitely recommend getting out there for the event or um, or swinging by by next weekend will be your best chance to get it. But uh, if you have questions on that, please reach out. Um, been a great response. I appreciate it from everybody and look forward to hopefully uh, being able to shake some hands and meet some people that have been following along with the podcast, but I have not been able to physically meet you yet. So looking very forward to that. Um, Jimbo, myself, uh, Danny will be there. I'm sure Brian, um, and I think I would imagine Dallas will probably be there. So a lot of the guys you've heard on here, um, will be there and, uh, be able to, uh, put a face to a name. So it should be good stuff coming at you. Uh, I'm recording this on Thursday morning, the 24th of September. Today marks the start of our hunting season here for the Pertnier Outdoors gang. Uh, a bunch of the guys are already up North. They went up to the Adirondacks last night and are going to be probably walking into the woods right now as we speak to uh, get after the old black bear. Uh, we are going to be doing the same, leaving this morning here after the kids get the daycare, and uh, and Sarah will be home watching over the fort, so God bless you. She will never listen to this, but I love you to death, and thank you for putting up with my, with my passion and my shenanigans in the outdoors. So we are uh, we're taking off at about 8 o'clock this morning, and uh, we will be heading up. We're going to actually take the boat. It's supposed to be super nice this weekend. So we're going to take the boat with us and uh, use that to get to where we want to have our base camp be to hunt out of. But we're, we're, we're expecting it to be in the mid, mid-70s, mid uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I think we're going to take the fishing poles and uh, do a little fishing midday too when, when I would suspect the hunting won't be too hot when it's in the 70s. So really excited about this little adventure we got coming here. We'll be off the grid. So I don't think we'll be posting much, but, uh, we'll be taking some pictures and having some stories and things like that, to to share and uh, recording some podcasts while we're out there. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I got a couple good podcasts coming up for you in the next two weeks. Um, I'm very excited to get those out, uh, a local group and then a, uh, a mobile hunting app, uh, base map. I got, I did a podcast with them, uh, yesterday and I'm excited to, roll that out to everybody. I think it's a, uh, I, if you've been following along, listen to other podcasts, you probably heard of base map, but, uh, I've been using it now, 
Uh, I've been using it for about a year on the free version. I had it on my phone and was just using it here and there, but I did purchase a membership uh, on Camo Fire. Uh, you can get, they run a deal and he tipped me off to it. And I want to tell you this now, cause, uh, you may get the opportunity to take advantage of it is that they run a, they run a special on camel fire. Sounds like every Thursday and, uh, you can actually get the full pro membership, which gives you access to all their content for all 50 States for 1899. Uh, that's what kind of prompted me to jump at it. I, I was like, well, I can't really turn this deal down. Um, so I bought it and I've been pleasantly surprised and very happy with how it performs. And, uh, and you'll hear me talk about that with Ed, uh, in a few weeks. So, uh, check that out. Keep your eyes peeled on camel fire. Make sure to use our link. If you're shopping on camel fire, uh, that will help us, uh, get a little commission and keep the, keep the ball rolling with the podcast. So, uh, that brings me to that. If you are enjoying it, please go head on over and, uh, give us a, Give us a subscribe, give us a, a comment or, or a like or a rating on the podcast, wherever you're listening. Um, that stuff does help. So we're, uh, we're picking up some speed here and heading into hunting season. And uh, it definitely makes a big difference to have those reviews. I am starting to learn. So if you could do that, that'd be great. You could use the link in our bio. Um, so when I say that, if you're on Instagram, um, if you go to our main profile page, there's a little website in there and it's called a link tree. If you click on that link tree, it'll bring you to a separate website, which has a kind of a myriad of different stores and different links that we've put, put on there. So we've got our own stuff there, but we have uh, links to some stores that we all use and uh, that we have some affiliate codes with. So if you just go and click on those links and shop from there, uh, you will actually be shopping through Pertnier Outdoors and we will get a little commission off of that. It is a little commission, but every little bit helps. And uh, we've had a few good months in a row where we're able to actually have enough to cover the expenses for the podcast. So that's fantastic. And we really appreciate your support out there and what you're doing on that end of things. Um, the other way you can support us right now would be with purchasing some merch. So we do have a couple new hats that came in last week and we we're crushing through them. So I, I bought limited quantities. I'm not trying to sit on inventory. So I, I bought uh, 24 of each. So we're down to nine of the orange hats. Uh, we have an orange trucker hat, Richardson with a rubber patch, uh, really sharp hat. Um, I like it a lot. It's, it's comfy. Uh, it's kind of like a 112, but it's an, I think it's an 882, but it's just, maybe that's all because of the color, but it fits just like a, like a 112. So we've got a, a few of them left. And then we've got another one that's more of a relaxed fit. My wife actually picked it out in a uh, big gym or uh, a Jim D'Augustino out of uh, PA. He's a close friend of the, of the podcast and Jim, uh, Jim's wife actually bought one and uh, looks damn good on her. So first off, good for you, Jim. And uh, second of all, uh, it's a good hat for your wife. So I gave one to my wife. I tried to get her to pay for it. She refused. And, uh, well, that's a whole nother story, but, uh, my wife has one. It looks good on her. So if you're looking for a, for a outdoors hat for your wife to rock, I would say it's a, it's a good choice for that. So that is that on that end of things. And I'm sure there's more, but you've probably heard enough of me. So let's get this podcast rolling. Enjoy. Have a great weekend. Well, I'm going to have a great weekend. You're going to hear this next week. So have a great week. Stay healthy. Wash your hands and keep feeding them. Hello. I, uh. Yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrel's got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> and really, 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 really cold and fun. Cold and fun. That's good that you think that of it because that's what deer hunting typically. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I'm glassing up on the pass, and I see these deer moving, and I'm like, ooh, there's some deer moving. All of a sudden, I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass, wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like, I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks what? about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So, so Robert's When you're 275 the pounds, I don't know how you do that, but. The Freightliner? <laughs> it's just like a creeper.
He's kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. <laughs> yeah. You know? He's like, <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping and <laughs> pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's, I know. Why did you say his name? Her, Herve Velichos. <laughs> <laughs> you know what pertinier means? If you know what pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. <laughs> Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast brought to you by Pertinier Outdoors. All right, let me get this set up. Wow, that was that was quite the effort, wasn't it? Yeah, Zoom is not intuitive in a lot of ways. It, it's always given me trouble because there's like 15 ways that you can do it. Yeah. And um, I'd rather do like FaceTime or something like that. But anyway, um, so uh, yeah, I'm ready. All right, good. So so I don't butcher your name. It's, it's Sharen. Is that how you say it? Sheeran. Sheeran. All right. Just like Ed Sheeran. I was just going to say that. Is that your cousin? No. No, no unfortunately no. not, right? Right. That's right. I'd ask for money. Yeah, I know. We all would. I mean, that's just human nature. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks, uh, thanks, Mark Sheeran, for joining me today on the Log Talk podcast with Pertinier Outdoors. So we're, uh, we're approaching our 2020 whitetail season here in New York, and I started thinking about uh, you know, big woods bucks and hunting in the Adirondacks. It's something I haven't done before. I've never deer hunted in the Adirondacks. And, uh, so I kind of had a little, uh, inspiration to try to find somebody through social media that could speak to, uh, to the Adirondack big woods buck hunting and, uh, and tracking culture and lifestyle. So I had kind of was, did a little search and found the, the big woods bucks crew out of, out of, uh, Maine and, uh, reached out to them and they ended up putting me in connection with you, which live, live, you live right here in New York and, uh, and are a member of that team. So that's kind of how you and I connected. And so I just kind of wanted to get you on here and shoot the breeze a little bit and get a little different flavor of whitetail talk different than hunting food plots and, uh, in cornfields. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I can tell you a little bit of history about how this all came about. I, I, uh, I grew up in farm country. I grew up on a farm and, uh, um, myself and my hunting partner, Bob, Bob Dunbar, we've hunted, um, in the Southern zone in New York since we were probably nine, 10 years old. And, um, and it was a lot of fun. And, but I was the kind of kid and he, Bob as well, but mostly me, I, I didn't like being in a, in a tree stand that much and, or sitting. Um, and so it was the early 80s, and I don't think I had a hunting license till I was 21. I mean, we just, we had so much land around our house, um, we just hunted whenever we wanted, to be honest. Right. Um, you know, it was kind of like, uh, you know, old school where you just, all the neighbors let you hunt on their property. You had your gun in the back of the gun rack at school even. You know, nobody cared. Right. I can remember hunting woodchucks literally in a field there was the only thing separating us from the school was a chain link fence and baseball practice was going on we're out there ripping shots with a 30 30 and everybody's just kind of looking over we're we're 30 feet from the mound you know yeah <laughs> and nobody cared nobody you were cared. in the game you were nobody just cared. trying to keep the woodchuck holes under control <laughs> that's right that's right so um anyway i i was i always tracked even as a kid i was fascinated totally fascinated by by tracking and, uh, and I was quite good at it, you know, and I could get close to deer and, uh, I, I fashioned myself, I wanted to be an Indian, you know, yeah. and, um, and then eventually, uh, I was building a company and I, I had other interests and girls came into my life and kind of all that slowed down. And then as I built my company all through my twenties, I didn't have a lot of time to hunt, but, but now I was going to the Adirondacks hiking and, uh, and I was totally smitten by the mountains and then i read the benoit book you know bryce towsley's big bucks the benoit way and i said that's what i want to do that's what i do that's what my inclination is and and then i started hunting up north and i realized wow this is a big place and i don't see nearly as much deer but i couldn't get over how completely beautiful it was it was like time warp you know i was in the same woods that the indians were in 
There was no difference. And, yep. and that, that struck me as totally romantic and beautiful. And, uh, and I could get away from life because my life was very stressful building a company. Um, and then I, then I finally looked for somebody to help me uh, learn to track quickly. By this point, I was 36 years old. And, and I said, you know, there's got to be somebody out there that will teach me. And I called all over. I called the Benoit's. I called, you know, everybody that was in the game. And then I found Hal Blood. And in 2006, I went up for a week in Jackman and we hunted together, you know, and, uh, and that, that was like the crash course, right? In Big Woods, because Big Woods is, you have to expand your thinking completely. And it's very different than initially it's very different from hunting in the food plots and the small patches of woods you might have in the southern zones of the northeastern states yep. and uh yeah so so i had to i had to learn that and i we can talk more about that as it goes on but that's that's basically how i learned and then you know i just basically have been tracking ever since yeah so you kind of answered that was the big thing I, the first thing i wanted to hit on was kind of your beginnings and background uh, in hunting and kind of what, how you got started. So it's, and I, I will, uh, I will admit to you cause I would feel guilty sitting here to tell you, I read fr- cover to cover on your book. So first off you have a, you have a book out there called learning to track and hunt wilderness whitetails. And you were kind enough to send me a copy of that. And, uh, as a father of a newborn and a two-year-old, I've had a lot of struggle to find time to, uh, to read, but I, I read the, the, I'm up to the first hunting story. So I really enjoyed yeah. reading your background and how you got to that point, which you hit on a lot of that stuff just in your, in your opening there. But I do find it interesting because I think a lot of kids, you know, if you grew up in the outdoors, even if you weren't a hunter, you can relate to that cowboys and Indians and wanted to go out in the woods and get lost or, you know, play with your friends. Like it's a very natural thing. And you kind of hit on that in there that you were, you were a tracker from, from the jump, you know, you just seem to have something that grabbed you there. And uh, I like how you explained it being a kind of a romantic thing, because I, I feel like most hunters, once they experience getting out of that 40 acre mindset and they get into that big woods environment, or whether it's the, the mountains out West, or if it's the big woods in the Adirondacks or up in Maine or New Hampshire, Vermont, whatever, it, yeah. it changes you. I think once you get out there, if you've experienced that from any side, it kind of changes your mindset on how, what you want to go after and what you perceive as a, a successful hunt. You know, you, you can go back to a cornfield and you can have the best hunt of your life as far as seeing deer and shooting deer, but you just don't feel as fulfilled as you did when you walked, you know, four or five miles and, and covered a bunch of ground and tried to put a story together based off of what you're seeing with sign and tracks and things like that. So I think that's, that's kind of what I wanted to get someone like yourself on here is just to, there's not a lot of discussion out there. Now, after I had reached out and we made contact with you, I learned, I had heard Hal's name, but I had never really didn't know a whole lot about it and about what he was about. So I've started listening to his podcast and I'm just like infatuated. Number one, their, their accents are just addicting. You know, that main you know, Northwoods accent is just fantastic. So that's awesome. But then you hear that just, they're just, they sound like they have so much fun, all the different experiences that they have up there in the, in the big woods with moose and bear and, and, uh, and deer, you know, it just, it's totally different than what we experienced just a couple hundred miles South down here. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's two different worlds. It is two different worlds, but here's, here's the crazy part. The whitetails are whitetails are whitetails are whitetails, right? They 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 don't know to change because they're in the woods, but they do thing they do things differently. But if you put it in the context of, they just adapt to the environment, whatever the size of the environment. For instance, you know, obviously, um, a suburban deer might live in five acres his whole life, you know, and dip from this development to that development, right, in a ravine in between or something. And they can grow to be monsters that way. And, you know, there's guys down in Jersey, for instance, that shoot absolute monsters that way. Mm-hmm. Um, then you get a little bigger. Maybe out of suburbia, you have some, some corn fields and some land. So that deer is going to be in a square mile. Then you go a little further out and it's two square miles. Once you get to the Adirondacks, I think 
personally, I think hunting the Adirondack Mountains is the toughest place to hunt for whitetails anywhere that I've hunted. It's, it's uh, the lack of access, the lack of logging. Um, there's, there's entire regions of thousands of acres where you might not see a deer track. Yeah. Because because it's climax forest, you know, there's no understory, there's no there's no feed. And and people can get really uh discouraged when they go up there the first time, they don't see deer for five days straight because they're hunting and they think they have that mindset of one or two square miles, you know, or maybe even five square miles. Um and that deer might just that one big buck might just travel the one day you don't have snow through the area you're hunting. So if you don't know what you're looking for, where you have you have to expand your mind, and there's a way to connect dots to shrink the property down. Where I hunt usually is basically four different areas, and all of them are over fifty thousand acres. Um, and those whitetails that might have a twenty to twenty-five mile swing per night during the rut. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like the rut so much. I hunt it and uh, I've chased yeah. deer all over God's creation, but I'd rather be early season or late season. I like the muzzleloader seasons the best, actually. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's how you break down the area that makes you successful. And that is something that Hal taught me because we didn't have snow but the first day and then it melted off. So we still hunted. So we had to connect those dots and find sign and find the deer. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a whole different way of, uh, pulling in the data and building a hunt. Yeah. Now, if you're someone like myself who doesn't have experience up in the big woods like that in New York or any of the States that have, you know, large blocks of timber like that. So what's your, what's your game plan if you're new getting into it? You know, you're, maybe you have experience deer hunting, maybe you don't, but let's say you have some experience. What are you, how are you, let's say you got a a weekend to hunt or one week to hunt. How are you connecting those dots and crossing off those areas so you can try to have some success? Because you let most guys maybe don't have the vacation time and they're going to hunt Saturday, Sunday, and that's it. And then maybe they come back the following week. Like, where do you even get started? Well, a couple of things. First, I think you got to know how to navigate so you don't die. That's, that's what keeps most people out of the big woods or, in the big woods, but unsuccessful because you're only going um, as far as you can still hear the road. And let me explain what I mean by that. I've hunted enough up there in the snow to, to see human tracks. And I know for a fact that 90% of the hunters will go up a ridge. And as soon as you get to the other side where you can't hear the road anymore, they stop and turn around. Um, there's a security in knowing that there's a road there. So the first thing I would do is pick a place that has a main road in the Adirondacks. Main, it's a little different because you have logging roads all over the place. Um, so that's a different beast. We can talk about that. But in the Adirondacks, I would find a place where a road goes one direction or another, at least twice the distance that you can walk in a day, meaning a straight road that goes east and west or whatever the direction is, it's a consistent direction. And then you just take a compass reading, you know which side of the road you're on, so you know which way. You know, if you're on the north side of the road, if you head south, you're going to hit the road. You're going to hit that road. Yeah. So, so that makes it incredibly easy. You could, you could literally not have a map. I wouldn't suggest that ever. Um, but you could literally not have a map. And if you knew the road went 40 miles that way and was consistently going through the mountain terrain that way, you, you know what side of the road you're on, you can get out. And then the other thing that I would suggest is when you get out of your truck, you count the telephone poles because they're in numeric order. So when you pop out five miles down the road, you know which direction your car is. No it all shit. Looks yeah. The same. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. a great. That's a great tip. Yeah, count the telephone poles. Yeah. So yeah, if you're well, if you're at pole four hundred and you come out at pole four fifty, you're yeah, you know. Let's say way. it's a north a north south road. You're at you're north of your car. Is that that's how that right? Kind of, okay. That's right. Now, I think in places like Maine, it's like I said, it's different because you have logging roads all over the place. If you have a map, the Gazetteer usually is updated every year. I take the pages out of the Gazetteer. I have them copied and then I have them laminated. I fold them up and I put them in my pocket. And any, any page of the Gazetteer is going to be bigger than what you can do in a day by a long shot. It's a huge chunk of land. Yeah. And that has all the logging roads on it. And uh, yeah, so navigation... I don't want to suck up the whole 
talk about that, but that's, that's crucial. You got to be able to use a map and compass. Yeah. So that, that takes the fear away. And then, um, so the first thing I would do is find a place like that. If I were a beginner where the road is, is consistent, then I would, I would look for any edge habitat. The edge habitat in the Adirondacks is very definable. It's not like where, when you log an area, all kinds of stuff comes up, right? And all kinds of shrubs and, and browse. And in Maine, deer don't, they don't go and travel a long distance to get to that beech tree or that beech grove, for instance. Yeah. Or in the Eastern Adirondacks, you might have a place that's lined with acorns and the deer will travel to get to that. The does will be there, <clears throat> much like Southern Zone. Maine, it's not like that because it's been logged so much. It's sort of feed is everywhere. Right. You know, it's, it's uniform. Um, and there's more deer. So in the Adirondacks, I would look for an edge habitat, meaning look at, look at a uh, topographic map, look for swamps, look for the edge. Then on Google Maps or Onyx, you can look at a satellite imagery and see where that green growth in the, in the lowlands matches the hardwoods. Because that's that space, that 50 yards between black spruce bog and then that hardwood ridge, those bucks love to run those. The other thing I would do is try to find a, a bunch of small peaks that are relatively close together near an area like that. That I guarantee will be a hot spot. If you have four or five small peaks that line a swamp, right? with a swamp in the valley, um, those bucks will ridge run those. And they know that the does are gonna be near feed. They know that they can, and especially they, they'll run that uh, westerly side, you know, or I'm sorry, probably the southern, I guess it would be the eastern side, southeastern side. They'll run that waiting for the wind to come over those mountains and swirl. Okay. They'll be about two thirds up and they'll just run that ridge. Um, so I would go from a swamp, I would go up, I would try to cross cut those ridge runners, right? Yep. And then I get on a track and go. Um, and if you can navigate your way out, um, you're gonna find a track. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's all so, it's so fascinating. And you, so you talked about mapping in a compass and you're wearing an Onyx shirt. Um, so how, how, has that, how has that changed your approach to mapping? Do you, or do you rely much on on using the cell phone and, and that as a tool or while you're hunting, or is that more of a scouting tool before you go out? And are you like, how important yeah. is that cell phone in your hand now? Are you using that just as much or more than a map and a compass? I'm still a little old fashioned. I like the map and compass only because I, I, I use the cell phone. I also have a GPS, but I find that, <laughs> you know, um, Onyx is awesome for this. For scouting, it's amazing. For hunting, it, it's amazing as well, especially in Maine because of the logging roads. So, you know, you have that map, you can see all the features, and also you can tell where the boundaries of property are, which is important. Right. That's a little less important in the Adirondacks because it's so big. Everything's forever wild. Right. Um, and so I tend not to rely on technology as much as I set up a, a game plan and then I get lost. I don't, I, I don't worry about, if I know the road is there, I know I have a compass. I'm not worried about where I am. Yeah. I'm allowing myself, I have a game plan. I say, okay, I know there's four peaks this way, two peaks, you know, depending on the size of the mountain, maybe one peak, right? Maybe I'm just going to circle a big giant mountain. Um, and so I set myself and then I just let the track dictate. Now, if I'm, if I'm still hunting, uh, it might be a little different. I might use Onyx more, um, you know, to, to find hot spots. But there's a big giant, uh, you know, burr oak tree here that's a little different from all the red oaks. And I noticed there's a lot more action there. That's kind of Southern Zone-ish, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll mark that spot because I know if does are there, I might be able to catch a track or shoot a buck. Um, so, so I think it depends on the situation. Basically, if there's snow on the ground, I'm going to have a compass in hand map, set up everything, look at Onyx, maybe once or twice, mark some spots on Onyx that I think are going to be good. I go out, 
if I don't catch a track, I get back on Onyx and I say, okay, I'm a half a mile from here. Because even with a map, sometimes you don't know really where you are. Right. So, so you can gauge distances and mark it and be like, okay, that's the distance. Now, I want to talk about distance for a second in the big woods because people have expectations. When they look at a map, they say, oh, I'm going to travel here to here. It's four miles. I can do that in a day. What you actually step in the woods is going to double that because you're going over the blow down, then you're going around that stump, then you're, and, you're, and it's soft, so it's sapping energy. So when you look at a linear distance on a topographic map or on Onyx, it does not account for all that bullshit. Right, right. You know? Yeah. It doesn't. And so I travel at about, if I was the average out a day, about one mile per hour, you know, if I'm tracking. Yep. And sometimes I'm cranking at three miles or four miles, almost at a jog. And sometimes I'm in the death creep, you know, so that, but it ends up being, so I might travel eight or nine miles a day. I'm just making a note of something I want to touch on here in a minute. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's in, I, I find the discussion about mapping and, you know, how are different generations, you're, a, you're, you're not, that much older than me, but you're probably, you're that next generation up and you learn from guys that had physical maps in their hand. My generation, yeah. we're, we're just inherently relying on our phone. And yeah. I, I've said this before. I wish I knew more about, I know how to read a map. I can take a paper map and I can read it. And I can understand what I'm seeing, but physically using a compass to figure out where I am, that's a, that's a skill I don't have, but the technology has gotten so good with, with both handheld GPSs and with the, you know, whether it's Onyx or base map or any of those other programs that are out there, I know like exactly where I am on my phone and I haven't had me had it fail me yet. If I prepare properly to use my phone as that device. And what I mean by that is, you know, downloading those maps for offline use, running your, running your phone on airplane mode. So you don't suck up battery. I've, I just haven't had an issue. I mean, over the last four years, between hunting out West and hunting here in New York and PA, I just haven't had a single issue with my phone running on X is what I had been using. I haven't had any issues at all. And it's, I think it's a great tool for people. And I wonder if you do this. I mean, I, I look at the pieces of property, the public that I've been hunting the last couple of years, they are just littered with weight with, I I'm like a waypoint guy. I love marking sign that I find and then coming back home, looking at it on the computer and trying to figure out if there's some consistency to this scrape line or this deer trail I was on or rubs that you're, cons you know, you see going back towards bedding and just trying to plot it all out. Do you get that deep into it or are you kind of more, you want to get on the ground and start trying to find that one track that day when you're out there? Dep depends on uh, what's on the ground. If there's snow, I literally, just sometimes drive, pull over. I had one direction a mile, one direction a mile, one direction a mile, get back to the road. So I'm not too far from my car. If I didn't find a track, I go a little further down. I, so, you know, but usually I've hunted enough in the Adirondacks now where I do look for those peaks. I look for the features, but again, you got to expand your thinking completely. Deer, deer in the Adirondacks do not follow a pattern really i mean there are bucks that will hang out in an area if there's groups of does there yeah. i mean he's gonna he's gonna do that you know that's his priority um but but you might have a giant buck you know buck track 30 feet that way and you just got to cover tr ground you know yeah. you if you're so myopic that you're thinking that there's bedding area there really isn't maybe early early season like muzzleloader season you got a buck that's hanging out in the same place he was all summer, eating, taking care of his antlers, making sure he doesn't bleed to death by whacking into something. You know, they have a spot that they stay in and they're, they're not going to travel very far. And they're very, the older bucks are very solitary. They don't, they don't like messing around with the little guys. Yeah. Um, so early season and late season is a little more Southern, right? You yeah. find that core area, but you're going to stumble on that core area because there's no rhyme or reason to it half the time he's just felt comfortable there his whole life, you know? So, or maybe that year he's not getting bothered by coyotes and he's going to, 
hang out on a, on a completely open ridge sometimes, you know, some, some place that you would never think he would hang out. So, um, so I think that, that it depends on the season, but in that main, you know, sort of, uh, November, you know, the rut, I'm just traveling. I'm just going if there's snow on the ground. Now, if there's no snow on the ground, I'm going to, I'm going to look for those peaks. I'm going to, I'm going to try to connect the dots. So this is where it's important. If you expand your thinking, deer have, just imagine a suburban deer. He's, he's going in a little circle on five acres, right? 10 acres. Then expand your thinking to a farm. He, he's got that one to two square miles, maybe five square miles max. And you can connect those dots, right? You know where the does are, you know where feed is, you know where the cornfield is, you know the apple tree over here. In the big woods, I look for signpost rugs because the distances are so great. That old buck wants to know what young bucks are in his 25 or 30 square mile area, but he's not gonna come in contact with young Joe over there in Allentown, right? Yeah. So he travels and he goes down to that swamp, he rubs his antlers on a uh, brown ash tree, and he smells, he says, oh, Jack Trombley and Bobby, which are all young bucks and an old guy have been there. So he's taking an inventory of who's around in his area. And then, and then he knows that registers, however deer register these things. And he knows that they're in his core area. So he knows he has competition. He knows that some does have hit that. They'll rub their head on that tree as well. So they're communicating by distance right. in this way. Um, I have only found one signpost rub in the southern zone of New York, and I've looked everywhere for them. They do exist, but it's usually in a bigger set of woods, yep. you know, um, where there's some distance. Uh, so I look for that, and then I will mark that on my GPA. I'll use Onyx for that for sure. That's, those are the ones that never leave my system. So I have like a checkerboard of that. And that odd you know, oak tree, like that white oak that sits in the middle of maybe a sea of red oak, they will go to that. Or an old apple tree that for whatever reason grew up in the middle of nowhere, they will find that. Huh. So um, the old bucks have lived long enough that they'll find these things. So I'll mark those things. And also I'll mark um, if there's a beech grove that has typically held those more than four or five times where I go in and they're there a lot for whatever reason, maybe it's a soil type. I don't know, but I know two areas for sure that if I were anywhere near there driving by, I would stop and go there. If it was a beech nut year, hmm. even though there's beech nuts everywhere, they'll hang out on one slope sometimes and stay there. They just feel safe and maybe they just are a little sweeter or whatever. Um, we've shot quite a few bucks. Actually, Bob shot quite a few bucks in one general area because of that. So, um, so yeah, I, I use waypoints and then I expand my thinking and I go, okay, boom, 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 boom. There's eight waypoints. Now I don't, I don't live in the delusion that that buck is going to follow that path. All I'm doing is upping my odds by breaking the big woods into something smaller some place to go and say, my odds are better here than they are in that, what I call the desert, where there's no waypoints at all, yeah. you know? And that's it. Now, I'm not going after a specific buck, especially in the rut. I think that's almost ridiculous in the Adirondacks because they're, they could be 10 miles that way. <laughs> right. You know, 25 miles that way. So, yeah. Which that almost, you know, I, that's almost something that, you well, know, we, I guess we experienced that with our property. You know, we have, I, I'm fortunate. I have farmland to hunt and I have kind of more big woods, timbered area to hunt. That's our family hunting camp is in the Finger Lakes region down in the, down in the hills. And there, there's, country. it is, it's awesome. And there's some ag, but it's not really that close. There's some ag within a couple miles of our cabin. So during this time of year, it's interesting because we don't see a lot of bucks because I know they're, they're, they're not near where we are, but we have good doe population that's near us. And that's what continues yeah. to seem to draw the bucks back. But, yep. um, you know, you've got my mind turning about these signpost rubs and these big loops that these deer are doing because we have a very hard time 
getting any kind of consistency other than from late October to middle of November. And the only that that consistency is just that rotating, you know, loop that the, these bucks are doing. So there's there's very little, you know, we're not getting them on a summer pattern. We're not getting any idea. So I guess where I was going with that, I lost my train of thought, but where I was going is that you kind of in the Adirondacks and those big woods environments, it's almost a little bit easier on your mind to go out in the woods and be happy with shooting whatever, you know, whatever buck that day is the buck that you want, because it's hard. We all get so in tuned if you're hunting farmland or even on a, on a piece of property you own, you like, you, you find one buck and like, that's the buck you want. And then you're hunting yeah. for that single deer all season. But the, like you said, as soon as November rolls around, you have very li- you have almost no control of where the hell that deer is. And you may not see him the whole rest of the season. You have pictures of him all summer and all through October, and then he's gone because he's off making his run and chasing does. So I, you know, I kind of, I, I almost think that's one of those romantic things about hunting the big woods is that you go out there without that thought in your mind that I have to go get franken beans or whatever buck you're after you know like it's not even on your mind because you don't even know what deer is really here yeah i i think that um some people a lot of the guys even trackers now use the cameras you know so they get a feel for what's out there and it, it can be exciting um i purposefully don't and it probably lowers my average i think there's there's a real value to cameras I, I do it in the southern zone you know i have cameras out in my at my farm i own a farm that's 80 acres not a farm it's kind of just brush country but was farm yeah. um yeah it was a farm a long time ago and uh so i think that um i don't want to know what's out there <laughs> this is personal preference though yeah i want i want the track to dictate everything or i want it to be completely an adventure and sometimes I learned years ago in 2000, I think it was 17. I was on a remote TP hunt with uh, Dave Williams. He's one of the ADK trackers, an awesome guy. He wrote the, uh, the beginning piece of my book. And we we're out there hunting. First day I come along and I see some does running and I see a nice eight pointer, probably just two to three year old, but, but a nice buck, something I would ordinarily shoot. And I had my gun up, I had the reticle right on his chest, and I, I didn't shoot him because I thought, ah, he's not big enough. And I thought about social media ribbing me. Yeah. And I have never in my life given two shits about that. But it, and then I watched him run away and I said, ah, that was dumb. <laughs> and, and I didn't get a buck that year, you know? And I said to myself, I will never allow home to infect my experience in the big woods. I'm yeah. letting that shit go. So the following year, the opening day muzzleloader, I said, I have this thing where I say, whatever the mountain, God, whatever mountain gives me, whatever God gives me, first buck I see, I'm shooting. I don't care if it's a spike horn, whatever it is. I want to remember my roots. Yeah. And, and I did. I shot a spike horn that day. Like an hour later, I was up on a mountain. And he came running up to me and he was dead. And honestly, it was probably in my top three hunts of all time. As I was dragging that buck down, I felt totally vindicated about why I'm out there. Right. And that year I shot a bunch of bucks, you know, it just, it was like, boom, boom. But every state I went to, it was, it was awesome. And some were big, some were small, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then this past year, I passed on some bucks, but because I wanted to, because I set my standards very high. And uh, so I didn't shoot a buck this year. So that's been my pattern. I, I'm all over the map. And what I've discovered is if you want to be happy, take each day as it comes and let that be your adventure and learn from it and enjoy it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. My brother, my brother, Jimmy says, you know, if, if that, deer, if a buck comes by and it just, he just feels it like that's the one, you know, it, and Jimmy shot, you know, he, we joke around and call, call him the two-year-old, us, the two-year-old, two-year-old killers. But you know, him in particular, he's got seven or eight bucks on the wall and they're all beautiful bucks. And most of them came from our property in Naples, but they're all, they're all two-year-olds. Maybe he's got one or two, three-year-olds, but you know, like last year, Jimbo shot, it was the last day of what had been 
rifle here, muzzle. I think it was muzzle loader in New York. We had a wicked snowstorm, and yeah. uh, and he he left camp, no four wheelers, no nothing, was all the way up on top of the mountain, and had this buck come by, you know, and it was the buck was just on the move, and it was snowing sideways. You could hardly see, and he shot the buck, and it was it was a small buck. It was a small eight point, you know, like a, a yearling eight point, but he was just he's like that buck just came by and he's like, that was it. That was going to be the last deer of my season. I, it wasn't a deer we had any idea about. It's not like he had any desire to kill it in October 1st. That was never on his mind, but on that right. day it felt right. And I think there's, I think there's, there's a lot to that. You know, we, the way that everything has become in our lives and hunting being one of them, you get so focused on, you know, doing it for the gram or doing it, you know, for the, for the likes and I'm just as guilty as anybody. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm, I'm not thinking that way. But a lot of times getting back to your roots, like you said, and just realizing why you're out here. And it's, it's that experience. It's that memory of the hunt and of the deer. And, you know, 20 years down the road, when you're thinking about that day and dragging that buck out, you're really not going to remember that it was a 120 inch eight point. You're going to remember that awesome day in the woods where you shot that deer and dragged it two miles out of the woods and you know had that feeling of accomplishment yeah yeah exactly I think that um I I'm at a point in my life I'm 50 years old and I've been hunting for 40 of it right and I'm just at the point where I want to be with my sons I really don't care what I shoot and here's why what I've realized is that my job in the woods is to enjoy myself in the chase put myself in a position that has great odds, if I can, break the big woods down, put myself in a position to shoot something big, and then let Lady Luck shine or not. Yep. And I spent the first nine years buckless in the Adirondacks because I was so tense and so driven. I was overdriven. I didn't think that I could catch up to deer. There's this big mystique about the Adirondacks, right? And, and the big woods. I was catching up to deer because I was so crazy about it. And I was bumping deer all over the place. I was missing deer left and right. I've missed, I think 18 bucks or something crazy because I was just out of my mind thinking I had to control everything. I'm such a controlling driven guy. And there was a real um, wonderful experience when I let that go. And I said, let the mountain decide. I'm just a passive person out there is experiencing something. The moment I did that, I started shooting bucks almost every year. That's crazy. I, I just, yeah, I just slowed down. And this year I wrecked my back. Um, I got in a motorcycle accident when I was young, actually two of them. And I was in a cast for a long time and, and I wrecked my back in May and I had a club leg. I, I lost the nerves in my left leg. And I have to slow down now. I, I still don't have feeling in my left foot, so my balance oh, wow. is way off. But I've been walking four miles a day, dragging my foot, and I've rebuilt most of the nerves in my leg. But this year, I'm going to have to go even slower. It's just, it's the way it is. And I'm looking at it as a advantage, to be honest, yeah. you know, because actually the slower I go, the better I do. Now, I don't want to, I want to be careful here, though if you're a tracker and it's snowing and that buck is moving, you're going to have to move <laughs> you know, or else you're never going to catch him. Yeah. But when the time comes, I've learned to relax in the death creep. I used to be extremely tense there. And now I realize I don't have that much control. And lady luck in that last 200 yards is crucial. She's either going to shine or not. So just relax, slow down. And that buck is either going to make a mistake or you're going to, but being tense doesn't help, yeah. you know? I think that's, that's a great tip. It's so true, man. If you can just step back sometimes and let it come to you rather than you go to it. But there's a, there's a little bit of a balance there too, because sometimes you need to be aggressive, but you learn that over time, whether that's with hunting or with other things. But I think with hunting, that's, you gotta, you gotta be like cerebral about it. You gotta be thinking about what just, you know, if, if a hunt doesn't go the way you wanted it to, you know, what could you have done differently to maybe instead of bumping that deer, or maybe you, should have made a move that would have put you in that position. So yeah, for sure. That, so I, a couple of things, I want to just come back around to that signpost rub because that came up. I had a podcast. I don't know if you heard of a guy by the name of Steve Shirk. He's out of PA. He's a guide down uh, in the Allegheny National Forest. And yep. I had him on the podcast 
and uh and we actually went down there and did a little training with him or a uh not what you want to call it, like a workshop uh Dallas and I uh my wife's cousin we went down and he actually took us and one of his biggest things that he focuses on in that big big woods situation is signpost rubs as well and uh so you touched on kind of the, the you're seeing it a lot of times be that one oddball tree in an area where you've got one apple tree in an area of, of oaks or, or spruce, or it's just, it's mixed, it's out of place, but it's a, so it kind of, do you believe that that kind of draws the deer to that spot or to that tree because it's a different, it's something different in the area? I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. No, it makes total sense. I think that um, I want to be clear for the audience. Uh, I've never seen a signpost on, and I know you're not saying this, but I've never seen a signpost on an apple tree. I've only seen it in the Adirondacks on two types of trees, willow and brown ash. Um, and brown ash looks like a dead tree <laughs> all the time. It looks like a mess. It looks like something out of Harry Potter, you know? Okay. Um, and uh, you can see pictures on the, web, on the web of it. Just go to bigwoodsbucks.com. There's all kinds of discussion. Hal's books cover it. Uh, there's some pictures in my book of yep. some signpost rubs that I've seen. Um, the, uh, I think that it's two things. I think the brown ash tree is in an area of that edge habitat. Usually it's where that sort of golden grass is. It's where it's wet, it's always where it's wet. I've never seen one really in a dry area. I don't think they can survive there. Um, and that collects does, right? It's near feed as well. So, but I think it's the fact that it, it's very punky. It's almost like cork. And I think yeah. it holds scent. And willow bark is like that too. When you touch it, it, it gives you like a dry talcum feel. And I think that that just holds scent better. Um, and uh, so I think it's the odd tree and it holds the scent. And I think they know exactly where those things are. And it's generational. I mean, they'll hit these signpost rubs. That's what makes it different. They'll hit them for 40, 50 years every year. Yeah, Sometimes they go dry, but... That's yeah. what I was going to ask you is if you see those same, po you know, those same sign posts being used year after year after year. Oh, yeah. 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 And that's yes, absolutely. And Steve's, Steve's thought, which what's different about that area in Allegheny National Forest compared to what you're hunting up in the Adirondacks is that you're in a, that forever wild situation where there's no timber cutting. It's all, you know, old, a lot of old growth trees, not a lot of underbrush. Whereas you go down to PA and the stuff he was showing us, is he's got these great big signpost rubs that are he almost call he calls them kind of like posted signs where there's a big buck that's a that big buck marks all of those rubs on the outside of those bedding areas that he's essentially posting his bedding area but it's so much different it's similar but it's different up in the up in your area and what you're explaining because it's not necessarily a bedding area it's an area where it's, you know deer are circulating through and marking their scent so that other deer know that they're there because they're not, you know, they're not congregating to a bean field at night or going to a, an alfalfa field where they all know who is who and what they're doing. They're, they're passing by their scent, not by visual or physical interaction. That's right. So That's right. I mean, if you think about a big old buck in the summer, he's, he might, there might be bachelor groups and stuff, like, but really there's no reason for them to do that. They're not as, as social you know especially when they hit five and six years old they don't like being around other deer they just don't and so all summer he's been kind of inventoried out of the scene he's gone yeah whatever they're doing out there i don't care i just don't want to hurt myself right i don't want to bleed to death you know i don't want right. anything bad to happen to me i'm very sensitive right so so he's living his life solitary and then he might interact with some bucks somewhere along the line, maybe early fall where, where the, you know, he shed his, his velvet or whatever, but truthfully he's once the rut hits though, it's on, you know, he wants to know everybody. He wants to know where the does are and he's just going to cruise like crazy and mark his territory to say who's here. And when he rubs those antlers, you can tell a lot of times when you're tracking a buck like that, when he's rubbing that, that signpost, he's saying, now I do want to fight. You know, now I do. I want every doe in this valley to be mine. And a lot of times you'll, you'll find a track at a signpost rub 
you track him for a while and you can see he'll make a scrape in the middle of nowhere where he's just tearing up the earth because he's so filled with testosterone. He's so ready to fight. He's so ready to have sex. That's all he cares about. You know, he's tearing up trees. When I see that, I'm pretty excited because oh, yeah. I know he's totally not in his right mind. And I, and if he gets with a doe, then I'm really excited. Um, you know, then, then I'm ready to start killing stuff. <laughs> have you, have you had, I mean, have you experienced that up there where you've, you've gotten on a buck and you've ended up catching up to him with a doe and actually making it, you know, making the shot in that situation. Yep. 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 The last buck I shot in Maine, um, we tracked down into a deer yard. We didn't mean to do that. You know, it's just where they were going because it was the last day of muzzleover season. And uh, the story's in my book, but, but basically I gave up. It was an hour before dark. I didn't know where I was. My phone was basically dead. I had left my map and oh I, I just basically knew the direction. So I had a compass and that was it. And, and my flashlight was dying in the middle of like four feet of snow. I mean, it was an absolutely epically brutal hunt. And I quit. I said, you know what? I got to get back to the truck. And then I thought to myself, no, I'm going to, I'm going to hunt back to the truck. So I kind of backtracked myself and I started backtracking and does came running down. The buck was running and I cranked him, you know? That's awesome. So, yeah. You just don't, and you just don't know how it's going to happen, you know, but you have to have the mindset of hunting. If I wasn't in that mindset, that opportunity, I wouldn't have had it work out, you know? Um, and he was on a dead run. I mean, he was probably doing 30, 35 miles an hour. I mean, he was fully, but he just crossed my path. He was coming down at me, crossed my path. I had the reticle on him and I shot him right through the heart. On the run? A, yeah, it was awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Was, that's fantastic. Yeah, he lawn darted right into the snow, like disappeared. You know, I had to dig him out. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And those are, so like you bring up a good point too, is that as soon as I've been there, I've checked out, you know, like, and I think everybody who's hunted, has been in that spot where you get yourself like locked in, like you're super focused, you're stealthy, you're, you're sneaking, still hunting along. And then, you know, if your mind gets out of that condition and you start getting frustrated, like you easily can check yourself out and then you start walking too fast. You're not paying attention. You're not looking for a sign and you can have an opportunity that you blow right in front of you. But if you were, if you were still even somewhat engaged, just a little bit locked in, you could make that happen don't is if you're in the woods if you're still in that hunting situation like you you're always in the game like anything can happen at any time and yeah, you gotta you gotta I, remind I, yourself of that you you do and it takes a real discipline i can remember being at camp one time and uh, then going over to jim massett's camp and we were invited over for the night and he's one of the famous adirondack trackers right and uh some of the guys were like, oh, tomorrow is going to be warm. I don't know if I'm going to go out. And they asked Jim, they said, Jim, are you going to go out? And he goes, of course I'm going to go out, you know? And they're like, yeah, but it's like 70 degrees or something. And he goes, they go, why are you going to go out to the woods on a day like that? And he said, because deer live there. They didn't fly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? It's yep. not like they flew away to somewhere colder. He goes, because the deer live in the woods, you know? And it was so matter of fact, it was hilarious. And everybody kind of had a chuckle and everybody went out and, and some guys shot deer that day. So you, you, you just don't know. You have to be in the game. You got to be in the woods. And, uh, yep. but I, I've, I've blown it many times where you get defocused, but I've learned to let, let my mind be in the hunt and let the world go. Yeah. Um, and if you, I guess if you feel yourself, I think a good tip is if you feel yourself starting to get out of that zone is stop, just stop, maybe sit down, maybe pull your phone out, let yourself, you know, look at your phone, just something, eat a snack, make a cup of coffee, something that will take your mind off of everything, recenter you and get going again. Cause I, I had a buck I shot, uh, maybe three years ago. It was the Sunday after opening day a gun. And I was, I'll be honest, I was super frustrated because I, I had a game plan for opening day. Nothing came together. Everybody else, I think almost everybody in camp either shot a buck or shot a doe in the first, in the first day. So it would be Saturday, first day of gun or that next, that Sunday morning, everybody filled the tag and except for me. And I, I got down out of my stand and I started still hunting and I wasn't hitting sign. I wasn't seeing any deer. And it was almost noon and I could 
I knew everybody. They were texting. We're back at camp. They're back at camp having lunch. So I'm like, my mind, I'm like, I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, God darn it. I'm like, I had this plan. I haven't put anything on the ground yet. Everybody else has had success. And sure as shit, I, I decided to still hunt back to camp. And I'm coming down the logging road, which is coming off the top of the hill down. To, it kind of uh, zigzags down the hill. And we use that road. It's cut into the hill and it's a real steep side hill. And the deer yeah. like to bed on the downhill side of that logging road. And we have spots, you know, where throughout the season, we kind of still hunt down and you poke your head out and look over the edge and then you back up to the trail and you can stay fairly well hidden. And uh, I'm coming down that trail and I actually hear my dad and my uncle, they're coming up to get a, to load up the get the, my uncle's got a side-by-side, load up the side-by-side with, with firewood. So I hear the, the four wheeler coming down below and, uh, and immediately I'm just like, I'm like, God, like I, I'm having this perfect still hunt. There's a little bit of snow on the ground and here you guys come. I can hear you talking, you're riding the, the ATV and don't they pull up. I hear them throwing the wood into the back of the, of the four wheeler. You can hear it hitting the bed. And I'm, so I'm, I'm like totally defeated, but I stop and I look down the hill. I'm at a spot where I can look and I see, a, I see a couple deer moving in the snow and they're just they're just feeding along They're and they're not far from where those guys are really, but these deer are just doing their thing. So I, I kneel down and sure as shit, I, I pull my, my scope up and I'm looking at the does and here comes in that group of like four or five does. Here comes a nice eight point buck right with them. And so all of a sudden I'm right back in the game and I, I jumped up and I got up close to the hills. So they couldn't see me. And I ran down to, there's a water bar in the road and I, I knelt right down there and sure as shit, do, 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 do. They go through my shooting lane and here comes that buck. And he reached his nose right out to smell that doe's ass right in front of him. And I touched it off and, you know, I smoked him. I hit him right, right in both lungs and he ran right down the hill and died. And those guys were 300 yards away. They heard the shot. They made it over there before I even did to get to the buck. And it was like, I easily could have checked out and I was very very close to checking out but that was such a it was such a good feeling of accomplishment but it also reflecting on it made me realize like I got like I was in a bad place I was emotionally getting upset I was putting myself in a bad mental state to try to actually make something happen and just like that an opportunity presented itself and so many times I start I'm talking about this but I'm thinking about all the different bucks I've killed especially with my gun they just the opportunities happen like literally in a split second and if I wasn't ready, I wouldn't have gotten that shot. And there's been enough times where I can think of where I wasn't ready and I didn't make the shot because I wasn't. So there's just as many success stories as there is failures of actually having that happen. It's, it's so much of it is mindset in that situation. Yeah, I think if your attitude is one of winning and, and staying focused, that's everything. Because without that, you're doomed. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're doomed. Then it's just, then it's just random luck and random luck will give you maybe two good bucks in a lifetime. That's what that'll get you. Yeah. You know, for sure. The, uh, I wanted to, I got just a couple things and then we'll kind of wrap this up. We're going on close to an hour here. Um, something that is intriguing to me is like the speed of, of your tracking. Um, that's something that I, I'm very interested in what your thoughts are on it as far as how fast, and I'm sure it's in your book and I'm just not to it yet. But uh, what you go out there, you know, you do your, your one mile by one mile block where you're trying to find a track, you hit a track. So now how do you, how do you analyze that track and try to figure out how, how old is it? How far away is this deer? What's he doing? How do you, where do you go from there? Well, the age of a track is, is something that only experience can teach you. I can explain all kinds of things because the, uh, and the age of a track is important. Let me first say that, but when you're first starting tracking, you're going to, you're going to track bucks that the tracks are a day old and you didn't know it. And then you will learn that you'll be like, Oh my God, you know, you get to the end of that day and you go, I've been chasing something that's that deer hasn't been here. He's, he may be 20 miles, from <laughs> right. um, you know, because it depends on the conditions. So um, if you have fresh snow, you just have to be aware when the fresh snow came and you know then after that time period, if there's the track in it, you know it's at least within that window, right? Yeah. So that's the best of all situations where you have good three to four inches of snow, it came in the night, there's a fresh track in it, you know you're in the game automatically. 
Now, if it's that three weeks of the rut, um, you know, the, from the beginning of November right to December, that that area, you may be running at points after that deer, you know, because they travel, you know. And if he's going in a straight line, and I, I say it like this I, for whatever reason, if I, ch 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 and it's just going, and that cadence is like the military, <laughs> you're in for a long day, my friend, unless you caught him at the end of a track where he's met a doe. But she's not going to travel like that. She's a lady. She's going to dance around and play games, and they're fickle. And then they may get into a group of deer. Then you have to make a big long circle to get around this. Or sometimes I do sort out the tracks. Sometimes I spend the time. It may take me two hours of being in one acre sorting out tracks because I know they may be bedded close by. Um, so it it really depends on what I'm finding, you know. And uh, so if there's a good track, he's with a doe, I know I'm in the game. I'll slow down a little bit, uh, conserve my energy, try to be as consistent as possible. Maybe skip eating my sandwich and keep on that track. Um, the other thing is there's, there's probably one of the biggest things that's kryptonite for the tracker is rivers. You have to decide whether you're going to cross or not. Most guys won't. I do. Um, and I don't worry about getting wet. If I, I wear wool all the time, I've gotten soaked. I've fallen in ponds. I've had all kinds of bad shit happen to me. But you just wring out your socks and you can move on with your life. Um, and if you do things right, like taping the bottom of your pants, you can go through waist high water pretty quickly and not get wet. Yeah. You know, not have it run in your boots. Wool is pretty water repellent for a while. Um, <clears throat> it also stays warm when wet. So anyway, back to the tracking. I look for a track that is uh, I will chase a deer that's doing that because a lot of times he'll bring me into an other deer or a bigger buck track will cross that. I'd rather be on a track than not. Yeah. It's rare that I don't take a fresh track, one that's been made the previous night. I have taken also tracks that are a day old if it's later in the season because I know he may not travel more than a mile. If I see that he's speeding and I find some beds and it's the last week of November or early December, I'll follow an older track because hell, it could be a shorter track than what I did two weeks prior, you know, yeah. even though it's a day old, I might, I, I catch them. Um, the other thing is Adirondacks, if I have a 30, 30 shell or a 308 shell and it fits sideways in his track, that's a good buck. If I'm in Maine, it's a 30 out six or my 35 whale sideways in the track. That's kind of the litmus test for me. I just take the shell and I go, Oh yeah, that's a good buck. You know, and I want the stagger or the distance between his tracks to be six to eight inches in both cases. Um, you know, track on one side, track on the other. What's the width of that? Um, and then I look for where they pee because every once in a while I've tracked some pretty big does and spent half a day following a doe and then realized, wow, that buck just squatted and peed out his ass. That's not a buck. <laughs> okay. Know? Explain. All right. Explain that. Explain how do you tell the difference between whether if it was squatting or if it was standing because that's i've never even thought about that it's fascinating okay well a lot of times you have to remember two things a buck will piss on his hocks right he'll and his feet will be close together and even if he doesn't make a scrape scrape sometimes they do that they just do it and the pee is going to be splattered all over the place because he's got a penis right um a deer pees out the back so she squats, literally her legs will go out like a dog. She'll squat down and pee behind her legs. It's not always that obvious, but a lot of times it is. Yeah. If you have a pee hole, you know, like this, it's probably a doe. That's if, funny. The other thing is when, when a buck pees, afterwards a little will dribble as he walks. That never happens with a doe. It just doesn't. They're not, the anatomy isn't there, right? Huh. Yeah. So, so you got to look for those little droplets of pee. He jumps over a log. You'll see when he lands, a little pee sprays off his hocks too. If he just peed all over his hocks, it'll literally splash out of his fur. Yeah. And uh, that won't happen with a doe. Now there's this idea also that hock stains, that orange stain in their bed indicates a buck. Does have hock stains as well. So sometimes that's not the best indicator. Um, and I am not good enough to smell and say that's a male and that's a female. They smell all the same to me. Right. When I find that, I take it and I rub it on my pants and make myself smell like a deer. 
and by the end of season that it, you smell pretty gross. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? But I'd rather smell like a deer than like me, yeah, <laughs> you know? For sure. Um, yeah, so those are the things I look for. That stagger, I'm not as concerned with stride because stride changes depending on how fast they go. Um, and I don't, I don't care if a deer is short. <laughs> you know, a lot of times a deer will be short. He doesn't have a long stride, but he's built like a bull, you yeah. know? Um, and uh, I, I look for that thick, wide, heavy deer. And uh, that's what matters to me. And making sure that the track is as, as wide as that shell. Yeah. So, so straight, you know, yeah. so, so to you, straight line is, is important to gauge, you know, how fast that deer is moving, how fast you move. If you're on a track that's going straight through, I'm just going to thinking about scenarios I've been in like straight with open hardwoods yeah. that was probably done in the eve at night in the dark. And that deer was covering a lot of ground is kind of right. what I've heard and what I'm, what I'm learning because I've found myself, I've made the mistake and I really up all that through last year, I would find a track and I'd be like, Oh, I'm right on him. But that deer made that track at four in the morning and he was covering, he could have gone two miles between four and, and 6 a.m. And I'm there at 8 a.m. And that deer has been there and gone for hours. And he could be in the next piece of property. And I could be told, I could, I could spend six hours following that track thinking I'm right on it. And I'm, I'm not even in the ball game. That, that's right. Yeah. It, you, you want to hustle. You want to hustle. And um, also the bucks in the, in the Adirondacks and in, in the big woods, they travel all during the day. They, it's not a nighttime thing. They, they lose 20%, 20 to 25% of their body mass in three weeks. Yeah. So they do not care about daylight. They, there's no alfalfa field. There's none of that. You got to eliminate all that out of your head. You got to just live by the track and say, okay, this was made at this time. And I'll give you another example. I want, and this is in my book. If you have crusty snow, for instance, and I had a buck that traveled the day before, and then he traveled that morning on crusty snow. The snow was old. So there's all these tracks everywhere. And both days, the snow was crusty. You know, it, it froze and melted a little bit, refroze. I mean, it was, it was nasty. And he walked in his own tracks. And the only reason I knew which track to follow was because he followed the tracks from the day before, because the tracks from the day before actually looked fresher than the morning's tracks. If they were separated, if they were walking side by side, I would have followed the older tracks. And I've tracked a lot of deer, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's an example where I learned what to look for. And I never forgot that. And since that time, even on crusty snow, I can figure out. And the key was when his hoof hit, the crystals that fell forward, weren't uh frozen to the snow because when when that launches even in cold it'll eventually attach itself molecularly to the snow in the front and the only way i knew that was by comparing the two and literally going down on my getting real close and looking and touching the granules you know and i was like oh my god because it did not look proper so um there's all kinds of things like that that you'll learn by following deer. The best thing you can do is follow deer, what you think is a good track, and then follow them. So my speed is very fast. When they're going fast, it slows down. Um, and you see it take a 90 degree turn, slow down. You know, he's, he may be right there. Yeah. You know, sometimes bucks give no indication of why they're doing, they don't start feeding. And I've seen that in the Adirondacks a ton. You know, they'll just, they'll just hustle somewhere, feed once and lay right down because that's where the food is. Right. Yeah. It's fascinating. This is the problem. I do these podcasts and then I get like obsessive about this new thought. And it's, it's a matter of, I can take a lot of what you're saying and I can do it right here around home. You know, we do have yeah. some big tracks of public land here in the yes. Finger Lakes and even our own, per, our own property. You know, there's a lot of anybody who's listening to this, you know, it doesn't have to be a, an Adirondacks or a, a main Northwoods environment. Exactly you can do right. a lot of this in, you can do some of this in farmland. You can make it happen. So I think the track. The last, the last chapter in my book addresses guys like me and you that live in the Southern zone where we spend most of our time in farm country. 
and what to look for and how to practice tracking. And I killed my biggest buck that way. Yeah. You know, it wasn't in the big woods. It was in what I call the little big woods, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of little big woods around. It sure is. And there's a lot of big bucks hiding in there too. Yes, there is. Uh, so as we kind of start to wrap this, this discussion up, I want to, I want to talk more with you and I, every conversation like this that I have, it, it spurs, you know, new topics and new things to discuss. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to get you back on come, uh, come deer season. Once you've actually gotten a chance to get out there and, you know, see how things are going for you and see what your season's bringing. But so two things as we, uh, I guess three things, but two things as we wrap up. So first, um, I'd like to hear your first buck story. I'm sure you, you remember the first buck you shot using your tracking methods that you have learned. So I'd like to hear your first story about that buck you shot. Uh, yeah. Being that, a tracker. It's one of my biggest bucks. And it was uh, in the little big woods behind my house. I built my house in a place um, that, that had 500 acres of, of, it looks just like the Adirondacks, rolling hills. Um, and I sh- shot a bunch of bucks back there over the last 17 years that we lived there. And um, it's in my book. It's called the Danielle Buck. It's a very long chapter, but I won't get into the whole preseason craziness. Um, but my stepfather had died that year, and I had a really difficult season. I mean, brutally difficult mentally. And that buck was a case where I learned I, I missed the biggest buck of my life. I shot one buck up in the Adirondacks in the hoof because my gun was messed up. I lost that one. Um, so I was going buckless and it was the last morning and we had snow and I was really in a bad mental place. I was very depressed and uh, I loved my stepdad and, and he taught me to shoot and just a good guy. And so I was just not having it. And my wife said, listen, take a day off for work. You got snow, get out there. It's the last day of rifle season. And uh, I had my shotgun because my rifle failed a bunch of times. And so I had my old 870. I wasn't feeling it, but it, it's a trusty gun. I shot more bucks with that than any other gun. Yeah. And it's sort of, but I had put a scope on it, which was new to me. So I wasn't feeling it. You know, I was a little nervous about carrying it, not very confident. And I got out and I couldn't find a track. I couldn't find deer. And I came back at noon, back to my house, dejected, was taking my wool clothes off. And my wife said, she came out, she goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm done. This season's been wretched. I've hunted harder than I ever have. I'm done. And she said, she threw me a sandwich and a bottle of water. She, she looked out the door and she goes, you got one afternoon left, go make it happen. And I thought she may as well slap me in the face, you know? And I, I said, you know, she's right. And I really, I went out and I said, I'm just going to still hunt. I'm just going to still hunt. I can't find a track. I got to totally switch my mindset. So I went down to a creek about a mile, half a mile down into a creek area. And, and I knew there were deer around. Now I was finding tracks, but it was all doe track. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go in the creek and I'm just going to, because of the way the wind was, and I'm going to walk in the water and just find my way up. But the water was deep because we had some storms. So the water was in my boots. I was cold. And, but I stayed in the water and I look and there's a bunch of does 30 yards and they're spying me, but they couldn't figure out what I was. Because it's and just was, odd for you to be walking in the creek. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was do, doing it so slow that I wasn't making any noise. So it, I must have looked really strange. And the embankment was up. So they probably only caught this much of me. So they're just looking at me. But they never got up from their bed. And then I see a fox come along. And he's walking next to me. And then I was like, okay, I am totally in the zone. And that's a rare thing. You know, the fox kind of looks at me and walks by. And... And I realized that's a good tactic, by the way, walking in the water is if you're willing to be very wet and cold. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so I, I ended up getting out of the creek when the, when the creek changed and the wind wasn't right. And I was going up a ridge and I found tracks going back and forth and they were big buck tracks. And I, we had fresh snow. Well, I got out of the creek and I wrung out my socks and, you know, got, got warm a little bit. And when I'm looking at these tracks, I said, you know, I can't even tell because there's so many tracks, but they were literally a linear track going back and forth. But I could tell it was the same deer. And, and I said, that's really odd. And I said, you know what, I'm going to pick a direction because I really couldn't tell because he was walking on top of the tracks going both ways. And I said, I'll just pick a direction and see if I can, can't find a fresher track in this montage of stuff. 
And uh, I went maybe, it was the shortest tracking job ever. I went maybe 20, 30 yards. I look and I saw what looked like a, a log, it looked like a deer, but it looked, it was way too big to be a deer. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I'm going to look at it through the scope. And I've never shot with a scope, you know, tracking. And I did. And it was a huge buck looking over his shoulder at me. And he, I later figured out that he was so old and so beat up. He loved to fight. And uh, he's probably my favorite deer of all time. That he just didn't want to get up. Yeah. He was tired and broken. You know, he had holes all through his neck. His big, his G2 was snapped off. He had scars down his nose. His ears wow. were ripped. And he had scars all through his body, old scars. So this guy was like king of the king of the mountain. And I shot him in his bed. He jumped up. He started running. I whacked him two more times. And I was so jacked up that I literally cut down and chased him. I had one shell left. I chased him. I, and then I came to where the blood was just pouring out of him. And, and then I came to him. And he was still standing there. Yep. There was no more blood in him. And actually, I started to cry after this because it was so heart wrenching. But he would walk and his ass would fall. And then he'd walk. And I'm 10 yards from him looking at this. So I, I'm shaking so bad that I'm like, I got to put him out of his misery. I hit him three times with 12 gauge slugs right through the heart and lungs. Yeah. And I'm really emotional because I'm watching this animal wobble and fall and get back up. And he's looking at me. And I mean, it was crazy. And I, so I shoot. I didn't even aim. I shot right over his back. So now I have no shells. And then I walked up to him and he laid down. His head is wobbling. And I put my hand on him and I just cried. I just cried. Wow. But for me, it was, I'm going to cry now, but it was my stepdad. That whole experience, it was, uh, it was awesome. It was really awesome. So that, that deer means the most to me, you know. Yeah. And then I brought him to the butcher's. And I found out that my butcher's wife had breast cancer and they ran out of money because of medical bills. So I donated the deer to him. So there's this whole circle of life that happened with that deer that was important for me. Yeah. And the whole life and death struggle, you know, was very apparent. So I think that that deer was there for me. Yeah. I think, you know, it was a spiritual experience. It really was. So that, that was my first buck successfully tracking. Shortest tracking job ever. Yeah. But, you know, I love that's a great that's a great story man I and that's there's so much to that and I, and I want to highlight something it's something that in that beginning of that of your book that I read that I I loved and it goes back to what you just said and it's we are we're hunting and the word harvest gets used a lot about your we're harvesting a deer but there's nothing harvesty about what you're doing you're taking the life of an animal you're killing a deer so it is an emotional, you know, everybody handles emotions differently, but I can remember a buck that my dad shot. It was the, I can't remember if it was the year. I think it was the year that my grandpa died and my dad's father, and he was a huge part of our lives and our hunting culture. He was, you know, the camp was built by him and his friend. And there's just a lot of family history there. And when dad shot that buck, it was one of my dad's best bucks shot him that year. And it was emotional for everybody. I mean, everybody had tears in their eyes. It wasn't like a weeping and sobbing and everything, but it was, there's just like this emotion that is with hunting and wish with the killing of that animal, you're taking that animal's life, but you're, there's like, there's always something more to it. You know, there's a memory that came with that, or you, you're, you're emotional about taking that meat and feeding your family. And there's just something to it. So I wanted to highlight that part that you had in your book, because I think that's so good that, you know, we have to be honest about what we're doing, but it's not, it's a barbaric thing, but it's not, it's a very emotional and a very, uh, a passion driven thing because we are proud and we respect the animals more than anything. I think hunters are some of the most appreciative and, and protective people over whether it be deer or any of the other game species hunters. So care so much yes, we're killing them, but we appreciate and respect those animals so much that it's something that it needs to be talked about a lot and shouted from the rooftops that, you know, we are, we're killing, but we also, you know, love and respect those animals. Well, I think the fact that we've, we've started to talk, I hate the harvest term. I think it's a, it's, I think it's a soft nod to the antis. I think yeah. it, it, 
it implies some some idea that we're guilty of doing something wrong, so we change the term. Um, in my book, I don't use it, like you said. I, I talk about killing the animal. Here's the difference. The anti-hunter doesn't understand that every time they have a steak, that animal died, you know, somehow. And I would rather, if I'm going to eat the thing, know what that process is. I engage in it. And the killing part is part victory, part remorse, and part joy. And a non-hunter can never understand that. They will never understand it. Um, it you always have remorse when you see the animal suffer and die because it's fairly chaotic, but it's real. It's visceral, and you did it. You participated in life and death. And then that animal is providing you life. That's how this works on planet Earth and has forever. Yeah. Without it, you know, um, whether it's you're eating a bean or whatever. Now beans you harvest. Yeah. You know, but I'm not picking a deer off a peach tree. You know, right. it's 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 looking at me and it doesn't want to die. You know, so I just I think that what you've explained is conservation is people who actually participate in the life and death arena. And because of that, we really respect the animal. Yeah. We respect them more than the anti-hunter who doesn't even understand that if you don't do that, these animals starve and they're going to die by one way, by hook and crook, they're going to die. Whether it's being tore apart by a coyote or some pestilence disease or a heart attack somewhere peacefully. But truthfully in nature, it's almost never peaceful. <laughs> yeah, you know? right. So a bullet through the heart and being dead in 10 seconds is a hell of a lot better than four hours of torture and being eaten alive by a pack of coyotes. Yeah. So they want to ignore all of that. So we're part of the conservation game. We make it so that they can live healthy lives because they're not overpopulated. If you want to see something tragic, watch a deer herd that's overpopulated, a suburban area, and then a rough winter with coyotes in presence. You'll see some real carnage happen. Yeah. So it's not. So we we can avert a lot of that and feed ourselves. So yeah, we kill animals. That's what we do. But we regret that part. Nobody likes that part. We like after and before, you know? Yeah. So true, man. Yeah. All right. Where, where are you hunting this fall? Are you going out of state at all, or are you just hunting here in New York? Yeah, I'll hunt all of November in the Adirondacks and my farm, yep. um, which we do every year. And then I'll hunt uh, muzzle loader season in Maine. So, and, and we'll chase snow. If there's snow in New Hampshire, we'll go there. If there's snow in Vermont, we'll go there. Nice. Um, but but mostly it'll be Adirondacks. I'll spend most of my time there and then a week in Maine up Sweet. with Hal and the boys. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. I would encourage anybody to, uh, to that's interested in this Big Wood stuff and like to hear a podcast and people talk about it all the time. Uh, check out the Big Woods Bucks podcast with Hal and Hal and the boys. It's very entertaining. And uh, I'll look forward to catching up with you during deer season to see how your season's going. I wish you the best of luck out there. And uh, I hope for a luck as well. Thank you. I hope for a cold are fall. Gonna, are you, are you going to try to to hit the Adirondacks? So you're going to go and try and your hand at tracking? I'll be I'll be up there for sure. We we hunt uh, early bear up there, so I'll be up to hunt early bear um, in a few weeks. And uh, I don't know. We'll see how the season goes down here, and maybe I'll you know if the time permits itself, I'll I'll try to make a run up there. But we'll see. I mean, I I, I always try to plan more than what I realistically can do. So. I got lots of opportunity around home here and with the young family, I, I don't want to oh, yeah. burn too yeah. many bridges, but we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. But we do go down to PA every year for, uh, for a long weekend during rifle. So that's kind of a little big woods adventure we do down there with a big group of guys. So that's fun, but that's cool. yeah, I'll have to, I'll hit you up. If I'm going to make a journey up North, I'll hit you up and let you know. All right. So All right. That'd be awesome. as we close, plug your book, uh, where can people buy this? Cause it, I would definitely recommend it. I'm enjoying reading so far in, I think it's a, it's a great little book of stories and trials and tribulations. Yeah. Uh, at bigwoodsbucks.com, uh, they can get a copy of it right there or, or any bookstore, but, um, go to big woods. It's easier that way. Yeah. And I also have another plug I want to do. I I'm an addictions expert and, uh, there's a book called the freedom model for addictions. And I've done this for 31 years. I started the first non-12-step program in the world. And um, 
if you want to learn how to move past an addiction and get on with your life without being stuck in recovery for the rest of your life, we can show you how to do that. And that's at thefreedommodel.org. Awesome. Well, you heard it here, folks. Check it out. Get yourself some books, get learned, and uh, get out there and get on a fresh track. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It was great meeting you. All right. Good, Good luck. We'll talk soon. All right. Sounds good, man. See ya. Bye.